thank you very much, Professor Neiman, for that warm introduction. Uh, let me say that, just before I begin, it's uh, about 7.07 .07 now, and I know uh, for those of you who would like to pray Mother Prayer, that Mother begins around 7.20. Um, those of you who feel you want to, to pray, you know, immediately right on time, you're welcome to quietly leave, go to the chapel, come back. But we'll be uh, finished in time, I think, uh, with my talk to be able to leave afterwards and have a little break maybe between the lecture and, and question and answer. So it's up to your discretion. To begin, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Islamic ethical reasoning involves bringing together information, values, and principles in the context of real human needs. The complexity of ethical reasoning requires the ethicist to be able to manage a great deal of information of varying importance as well as conflicting norms. Many scholars have stressed the importance of reason in Islam. Dr. Omar Abdullah, in his short paper, Living Islam with Purpose, says, the authority of reason forms the foundation of Islamic theological and legal thought. Dr. Ibrahim Kalin explores the topic on a deeper level in his uh, article and now short book, Reason and Rationality in the Quran, where he argues that reason is by itself neither a principle nor ground of knowledge, truth and rationality because our uh, epistemic encounter with the world takes place in a wider context of relations and significance. This context is the metaphysics of creation. In this lecture, I want to explore the way in which imagination, as a mode of thinking, relates to and forms an essential part of the reasoning process. Human imagination is both limiting and freeing as we contemplate the reality of the world in which we live and which we would like to see improved. The limits of our imagination. To begin our exploration, I am going to, perhaps surprisingly, tell you a joke I heard in Arabic from a former student about 10 years ago. Here it is. There once lived a man who was blind from birth. He lived in a farming village in the mountains of Yemen. He used to pray to God, O oh Lord, just let me have sight for a few minutes so I can see the beauty of your creation. One day, the man was sitting in the empty courtyard of his house while various members of his family were busily engaged in tasks close by. His wife was scrubbing clothes in the laundry tub beside the kitchen to his right. His children, Two mischievous boys with wind-blown hair and calloused but delicate feet were climbing a fig tree behind him. And his brother, a strong, ruggedly handsome man with great physical strength, was repairing a stone wall on the other side of the yard. As the man sat and quietly uttered his prayer one more time, suddenly, without warning, he could see. Just as he realized what was happening, that he was finally seeing, a rooster dashed by, the red combed head bobbing directly in front of him. Seconds later, his sight faded once more. The next day, the man heard a tremendous noise coming from outside his house. Voices were raised in song, tambourines thumped and were shaken, and hands were clapping. It was a wedding procession passing in front of his home. The man moved toward the doorway facing the road where his family was gathered to watch the joyful parade. What a beautiful bride, his wife exclaimed. The man turned to his wife and asked, is she as beautiful as the rooster's head? Now, well, this was told to me as a joke. When I first heard it, it struck me as a kind of parable. Perhaps many of our jokes before comedy was appropriated by the modern capitalist system as a product that could be extracted from its cultural and discursive context, more often used to serve such a purpose. Indeed, this joke seemed to me to be clearly rooted in an Islamic sensibility. The primary moral of the story is that while human beings, is that human beings have extremely limited knowledge of reality. 
While sighted people have more knowledge of the visual world than a person who has had sight for only a minute of his life, in relative terms, when we consider the vastness of the Earth and the universe, the difference in our knowledge is so minute as to make it irrelevant. Further, the story tells us that visual knowledge is selective, superficial, and can be limiting. It is impossible to see or pay attention to all the things that are even close to us. The blind man, when he has sight, sees the rooster, but not his wife, children, or brother. He does not notice the trees in the yard or the mountains surrounding his property. Similarly, every human being is limited in his or her perspective and attention. Finally, the man's experience of the visual world is limited to what he saw of the rooster's head. Now, this forms the basis for comparison for everything else in the world. Similarly, every human being has limited experiences of the world, but it is experience that greatly influences our convictions about what is possible or probable in the world. And just as importantly, experience frames any new issue or challenge that arises. This is a mental process that we cannot avoid initially confronting. Now you may still be wondering what all this has to do with ethics. Perhaps the story seems to you to be more of a theological or a spiritual parable than an ethical one. What I need to emphasize is that when I am constructing an ethical response to a situation, the theological or spiritual teachings of Islam are the foundation for anything I am to build. This is what I believe Ibrahim Kalin means by the metaphysical context of reasoning. What this means to me is that as a Muslim, I always need to keep in mind a few key convictions of faith while I struggle with an ethical issue. First, the conviction that I have been created by God with intellectual capacities. And here I use intellectual in the broadest terms to include reason, imagination, memory, and all other modes of thinking. And that if these capacities are not severely impaired or immature, then I am morally responsible before God. This is what Islamic scholars term taklif. Second, I am convinced from Islamic ethical teachings that humans are born without sin. Indeed, we are born with an instinct to recognize the divine. This instinct, called fitrah, can be nurtured and supported by people around us, or it can be suppressed and distorted. Thus, while we are born without sin, we are born into history. If we are loved and nurtured well, then our instinct to know God will be the foundation for the development of moral reasoning. If we are abused and neglected, our moral formation might be distorted or impaired. Third, as a human being, I am completely and utterly distinguished from God who created me by the fact that God is omniscient and I have exceedingly limited knowledge, the moral of our rooster story. I can never claim to know all the reality of any situation. To claim such knowledge is heresy. Fourth, I am convinced that as a human being, my reasoning is fallible in all things. Only knowledge that is conveyed from God through a flawless means of transmission is certain. Thus, the Quran and verified prophetic teachings yield certain, certainty. Extracting rulings from these ontologically unique and flawless sources of knowledge, however, in the vast majority of cases, yields only probable knowledge. This is because in examining any issue, we are normally faced with sources that are linguistically ambiguous, or apparently in conflict with other sources, or were revealed in a context that seems to limit its application, and we can disagree on the extent to which the context does limit or expand the application of a clear verse. 
Now, both Shiite and Sunni schools of thought have had uh, a mechanism for making some probable rulings certain. Shiites posited the infallible imam, whereas Sunnis look to the consensus of scholars. As someone who considers herself to be operating broadly within the parameters of the Sunni school, I also agree with those among the Sunnis who limit the binding authority of consensus to the very early period of Islam, and I personally believe that this authoritative consensus is operative only for a very limited number of issues, mostly having to do with the religious construction of the community. So when we're dealing in the area of ethical reasoning, we're primarily dealing with probability. Having outlined the cosmological and epistemological context in which I engage in ethical reasoning, let me turn again to the role of imagination in the construction of Islamic ethics. As I mentioned, Islamic theology holds that human beings are born with an innate capacity to know God, but that capacity has to be nurtured. It is the individual duty of parents or guardians and the collective duty of society to provide an effective environment of moral formation for children so that by the time they are physically and intellectually mature, they will be ethical adults. <coughs> a major component of childhood moral formation, and I believe this is universally true, is the imparting of lessons through imaginative role playing, songs, poems, and the telling of stories through many other media. Through imagination, the child can experience the perspective of another person, or even a non-human living creature. Imagination allows a child to vicariously experience an experience that would, if experienced in reality, would be too dangerous or difficult. But through this imaginative exercise, it forms the foundation for good decisions later in life. A child who is deprived of these imaginative experiences can be stunted in their moral formation. Of course, it is not only children who need moral formation. We adults, in the face of our own selfishness, as well as the forces of negativity that we face in our lives, need the foundations of our moral formation continuously bolstered. As Muslims, we turn to the Holy Qur'an and the teachings of the prophets to do this. And here we see that one of the ways God shapes us through his sacred word is to engage our imagination. The Qur'an mentions at least a few dozen times a parable or the importance of parables. And the purpose of parables is given uh, in Surah Ibrahim, which is Surah 14, Verse 25, which says, God strikes parables for people so that they might reflect or remember. Here we see the purpose of Quranic parables is to simulate our minds, to recall and reflect on the ways of the Creator. An example of a Quranic parable is from the following verse, from Surah Al-Baqarah, Surah 2, and this is verse 261. The parable of those who spend their substance in the way of God is that of a grain of corn. It grows seven years, and each year has a hundred grains. God gives a manifold increase to whom he pleases, and God cares for, and he knows all things. Or another from Surah Ibrahim, Surah 14, verse 24, do you not see how God sets forth the parable of a good word? It is like a good tree, firmly rooted, reaching out with its branches towards the heavens. Then there are other places in the Quran where a story is told that stimulates our imagination in a way that engenders empathy, in some surprising ways. For example, in Surah the Neman, Surah 27, the Surah of the Ant, which describes an encounter between the mighty prophet and King Solomon and a lowly ant. And this is what it says. One day, troops of jinn and men and flying creatures were assembled before Solomon 
and then they marched out until they came upon a valley of ants. And one of the ants, and it is uh, in the feminine form, so the commentators say this is the queen ant. So the queen ant calls out, hey, ants, get down into your dwellings. Otherwise, Solomon and his troops will crush you without even noticing. Solomon smiled, laughing at her words, and said, O oh my Lord, inspire me so that I may be forever grateful for your blessings, with which you have bestowed upon me and my parents, and that I may do what is right in a way that will please you, and include me by your mercy among your righteous servants. Here we see a, a really startling uh, shift in the perspective in this Quranic story. What begins with the image of all of the mighty troops marshaled in front of the great king and prophet Solomon, then suddenly and dramatically shifts to the perspective of a tiny ant who does not see that marching army to be a great thing, but a threat, a threat to the existence of her and her own, own her whole community. So here we see the Quran showing us a critical relationship between imagination and empathy, because unlike the prophets, we cannot hear or understand the speech of animals. We need to imagine their perspective and how they see us and our activities. And how are we to fulfill the prophetic imperative to love what, for your brother what you love for yourself? And how are we to be trustees or stewards of the earth without this empathy? A beautiful example of this is in the writings of Sayyid Norsi, who was born in the late 19th century in the Ottoman Empire and lived through the dismantling of the Caliphate. Norsi had some difficulties, uh, at least we can say, at times with the new Turkish regime and spent a considerable amount of time in prison where he wrote some of his most compelling work. Nursi was keen to demonstrate the continuing relevance of the Qur'an in a secular age, and in an often charming way, linked his own experiences and understanding of science and nature to revelation. Here, for example, he uses the setting of his, in, of his imprisonment to discuss a verse, a Qur'anic verse, that emphasizes the unique creative power of God and the need for humanity to live in harmony with the rest of creation. And this is what he wrote. It was almost the time when the flies are discharged from their duties in autumn. Because of the insignificant annoyance they give, some selfish humans apply insecticides to our prison cell to kill them. This aroused acute pity in me. However, the flies, in resistance to those humans, multiplied even more. There was a clothesline in our cell. In the evening, those tiny birds would be lined up in an orderly fashion on the line. One day, my friend, Suleiman Rushdu, rose to hang up the washing, and I said to him, don't bother those tiny birds, hang it up somewhere else. He replied, we need the line, let the flies find somewhere else for themselves. Anyway, in the early morning, a discussion started in connection with this small incident about little creatures like flies and ants, which exist in great numbers. I said the following to them. The species which exist in multiplying great numbers have important duties and great value, like an important book whose copies are multiplied because of their significant duties. The all-wise creator greatly multiplies these tiny missives of divine destiny these words of divine power. The wise Quran announces, and here he quotes Surah Al-Hajj, uh, Surah 22, verse 73, O humankind, a parable is struck, another parable. So pay heed to it. Those whom apart from God you deify and invoke will never be able to create even a fly, even if all of them were to come together to do so. And if a fly snatches away anything from them, they cannot recover that from it. Powerless, indeed, is the seeker, and so is the sought. That is to say, Norsi goes on, the creation of flies is such a miracle of the Lord's creativity that if all things and beings to which creativity is attributed were to come together, 
They would not be able to create even a fly. They would not be able to imitate the miracle of the Lord. And then he says, O oh, you egotist egotistical human being, apart from the thousands of instances of wisdom in the life of flies, consider only the following small benefit they provide for you and abandon your hostility to them. In addition to keeping you company in your solitude and loneliness when in exile, they prevent you from falling into heedlessness or confusion of, of thought. You see how their delicate manners and their washing of their faces and eyes as though taking evolutions, they teach and remind you of human duties such as cleanliness, performing the prayers, and taking ritual evolutions. Here we see a remarkable demonstration of the use of imagination to learn a spiritual lesson that leads to an ethical position. First of all, Norsi goes beyond his narrow personal perspective, and even the perspective of his species, that is human beings, and looks at things from the fly's perspective. He has acute pity for the flies who are being poisoned. This leads him to take the ethical position that his prison companion should not use insecticide. What is very interesting to me here is the way Norsi is able to bolster his ethical argument through a further exercise of the imagination. I think I could uh, be fairly certain in saying that most Muslim scholars, in such a case, would apply the ethical principle, harm should be removed, to justify killing the flies. After all, these people are already in prison, suffering significant hardship. I would imagine um, that their desire to remove the flies from their environment could be understood to reflect a true need on their part. But in weighing needs and benefits, Norsi does not forget the spiritual benefits. Could there be a spiritual benefit in allowing the flies to remain? Norsi discovers this benefit through his imagination by seeing the flies' movements to mimic ritual evolution. The flies are therefore an important reminder or even a sign sent by God to remind the prisoners to be attentive to their evolutions and prayers. Thus, in order to even know all the harms and benefits of an ethical situation, Norsi shows us that we have to reflect beyond reason and engage our imagination. Now, it is important at this point that I make a distinction between imagination and fantasy. And the Arabic word that's used in Islamic ethics for fantasy is wah. Muslim ethicists say that, if you remember, I mentioned earlier that almost all ethical reasoning falls in the range of probability and not certainty. There are four broad classifications or a range of knowledge and ethical reasoning. The strongest is certainty. The next strongest, or the next slightly weaker than that, or certainly significantly weaker than that, is probability. Probability where um, there is a confidence that the decision being arrived at is the correct one, but there is a possibility of being incorrect. And almost any statement that a Muslim ethicist makes will fall in this area because the other two lesser levels of knowledge are possibility and fantasy. And it is uh, impermissible to act on a conclusion that falls in the area only of possibility, and of course, fantasy is completely out of the picture. So when Muslim scholars engage in ethical reasoning, uh, very rarely will they be certain most of the time, their answer will only be probable. And that is why, after engaging in extensive discussion and examination and research of an issue, arguing vigorously for their position, at the end of 
that reasoning process, the scholar will say, well, law who I learn, and God knows better. This leaves open the possibility um, for correction. It is an acknowledgement of that absolute division, as I said earlier, between human beings and God. God having complete and perfect knowledge of all things, and human beings, uh, unless unless speaking about revelation, do only have probable knowledge. Now let's talk a little bit more about fantasy. What is fantasy? Fantasy is imagination unrestricted by reality. So when we're speaking about imagination, we have to ensure that we're not engaging in fantasy. Imagination is disciplined by reality. And imagination does not eliminate the need for research to engage in fact-fighting and exercise due diligence in this regard. So all of the uh, tools of fact-fighting um, need to be employed before arriving at a decision about an ethical issue. Whatever science is available, whatever um, means of finding the facts and the reality of the situation need to be attended to. It's part of the puzzle of ethical reasoning. Nor does imagination eliminate the need for consultation and representation in decision making. What this means is that one group of people cannot simply sit closed up in a room and imagine what another group of people might feel like in a situation or how a decision might affect them. The Quranic principle of shura, consultation, needs to be taken seriously. And consultation means that all of the people of a community and, and certainly all of the people affected by a decision needed to be, need to be included in the decision-making process. All of us have a very limited perspective and can only pay attention to one aspect of an issue at a time. Again, going back to our uh, man who had sight only for a brief time. And all of us are in that situation. So for example, if a group of men are deciding what is good for women, imagine, imagination is not good enough. And certainly in such cases, there usually is a lot of speculation. And I would say, dare say, even fantasizing. Khaled Abu Fadl, distinguished professor of Islamic law at UCLA, gives some disturbing examples of some male Muslim scholars engaging in this kind of fantasizing in his important book, Speaking in God's Name. My students know I like this book because I keep assigning it. Indeed, we might say, going back to the joke or parable with which we began this talk, that many of these men could not truly see the bride for the rooster's head. Finally, imagination and the belief in God's creative power. When it comes to social divisions, communal divisions, sectarian divisions, hostility that forms between people and groups of people, it is very easy to fall into the conviction that people will never change, that situations will never change, that hostile communities will eternally be hostile. And here again, the Quran guides us to look at things another way. The Quran says, it may be that God will create affection between you and those whom you now consider enemies. God is all powerful and God is all forgiving, oft forgiving and most merciful. Now here is an opportunity for thinking about things differently, imagining things differently. 
Because it may be that all facts on the ground, that all indicators, real indicators, show us that there will be no end to hostility soon, and there may be no way out of the situation that we can see. But here the phrase, whom you now consider enemies, is very important. The Qur'an does not call these people enemies, but they are those whom we perceive to be enemies, reminding us that there is a difference between perception and reality, and that what we see is very limited and a narrow part of the reality of God's universe. So even if we can't imagine or see currently any way out of a situation of hostility, we need to engage in an imaginative exercise about the, that day when we will not, we will no longer be enemies. Indeed, there will be affection between us, affection and love. So we remain open to the possibility of a better, more peaceful world and having friendly relations with those who are hostile to us and to whom we are hostile. Because we believe that God indeed has the power over all things and can transform hearts full of hate into hearts full of love. So here again, in the end, is a theological and spiritual foundation for ethical reasoning. Without that foundation, we will be trapped in our very narrow, superficial, and limited understanding of the possibilities for humanity. But with that foundation, we will be open to many things that are simply with our reason and our vision we are unable to see. And that, I would dare to say, is part of the goal, a major goal of revelation. Thank you.